Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to see you all. Thanks for uh, making time to, to come for the first in a series of our seminars. Uh, first, uh, I'll uh, do a bit of housekeeping, just pointing us to like, this, this is your exit here, yeah? fire exit in case of fire. And then the, the restrooms are just uh, down this corridor, so get out of the door, don't go straight, straight ahead. You see it's no stairs to your to your right. So the restroom is just on the on the stairs there. And uh, yeah, again, just to emphasize that the the, the um, program has been recorded, seminar is recorded, so your voices will go on record, uh, just so you know. Um, yeah, I haven't done that. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll introduce uh, to this uh, speaker. Uh, most of you already know him. Uh, but for those who do not, uh, today we'll be having Dr. Andy Duchamp speak to us. Um, Andy is, is a lecturer in international development at CEDEP, Center for Development, Environment and Policy at SOAS, uh, where he convenes the dissertation program and where he also um, convenes a whole range of courses on climate change and development. And his, his work focused on Southern Africa and to, to a great extent on uh, Latin America, America. Yeah. Yeah, South America. And uh, his work look, bring insights and, and ideas from human geography and um, social anthropology together to sort of consider some of the big problems around the environment and development. And uh, one of his key areas is key areas of focus, I mean, is uh, climate change and development. And he's also interested in questions of power, uh, knowledge, but also vulnerability in, in, in the context of climate change. So uh, I would say all of that. Um, Andy will be presenting today on some of his recent work in Latin America, um, uh, examining um, ecosystem-based adaptation, what it means and what the potentials and, and, the, um, and some of the questions around uh, ecosystem based adaptation. Uh, so um, I invite you to join me to welcome Andy uh, to, present, to present his talk. We'll be speaking for about 40 minutes, 40 for five minutes. Afterwards, we'll have a question and answer session. So, um, so please listen. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming um, and for bearing with the uh, you know, technological setting up process. Uh, the point of this is actually, uh, I think we're really trying to make an effort to ensure that our distance learning students at SOAS are much more included in the life of SOAS on campus, if you like. And so the point is to record this, put it up on um, the web so that all well, distance learners and anyone can, can, can watch it. And um, we're also trying to reach out uh, beyond SOAS. And I have a quick question. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are for political ecology and development masters. I know I've, I've in fact met some of you. Um, is there anybody who's come from further afield who's seen this? Um, so where are you guys from? I'm from Imperial College. I'm based in the uh, Natural History Museum. And I'm just the Great, okay. And yourself? Uh, King's College, the Department. Awesome, okay, right. So the message is starting to get through. So hopefully, we'll get more people sort of coming through from other places. Uh, it's been a bit of a rush to set up this seminar series. Um, so, but now we're, I think we've, we've got to the point where the advertising will be out uh, uh, with a, a little bit more notice than it was for this seminar. So, um, without any further ado, um, let me introduce what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, you probably read um, the abstract already, but this is based on. Um, a paper which is currently in review with uh, Global Environmental Change, in fact they've just come back with the comments and what they want us to address, um, and it's, uh, it's about ecosystems-based adaptation, um, posing this question, are we being conned? Um, hmm. Sorry, I think it's like... Yeah, but before I talk about that, I do actually want to talk a little bit first about the SARS Political Ecology of Environment and Development uh, research group that we have here at SARS. And um, it's a research cluster currently in development studies and in the Department of Development Studies, but it's a much broader initiative than that because we have about 30 odd people so far from across SARS 
And we're looking really to, to point out that there's quite a lot of environmental research in relation to development and other issues that goes on at SOAS. And we want to give it a bit more of a profile. And one of the ways of doing that is getting us all together into a, into a group. And you can see we have a little website. You can probably see that at the top there. And um, we are people from uh, what we're looking at political ecology and environmental change. We're from area studies, development studies, economics, environmental history, um, human geography, international relations, law and politics. And we're all, I guess, to a greater or lesser extent, united by this concern of how um, capitalism, uh, development, and social justice and inequality as well uh, intersect the changes on land, in the oceans, and in the atmosphere. That pretty much covers everyone, I think. Um, we have a really active research agenda. If you go and look at what some of our members are doing, there's little members kind of tab you can click through to up there. You can see some of the stuff that we're up to. We've got the seminar series, which there'll be two more this term. We're going to have a lay more from January to March. You're very welcome to come and see people from uh, SOAS, like myself and Adamini, who will be speaking next week. Um, but also, we'll have people from a bit further afield who can speak to the kinds of research questions that we, and you, hopefully, are also interested in. So, um, if you know of any other groups who might be interested either in our seminar series or in any other aspect of CV, please come and see me and or me at the end so that we can sort of register that interest and see how we can get in contact. Um, so, back to the presentation for today, and let me explain a little bit more what I'm going to talk about in detail. So, the presentation is going to take us through an introduction to ecosystem systems based adaptation and the gaps in the literature that are currently there. Um, it's going to then take you through the background to the research of this uh, on ecosystem based adaptation, which we did in Mexico in the Sierra Mario de Intel. I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, we'll take you through methodology. Uh, the results and the conclusions and suggestions for, for future research. So um, let's first clarify what are we talking about when we use this term ecosystem-based adaptation. So one of the most um, common definitions is the use of biodiversity and ecosystem services to help people to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change, which was uh, sort of devised by the Secretariat for the Convention uh, on Bi Biological Diversity um, back in 2009. And there's quite a number of um, quite sort of, I guess, high profile international actors who have been interested in this term. You have some of the people you might expect to be the United Nations Environment Programme, is very interested, for example, uh, the Nature Conservancy, IUCN. There's a lot of uh, uh, conservation-focused organizations which are interested, but there's also been interest from development organizations such as the World Bank, and one of the reasons for the term and its popularity has been that some people have been concerned that biodiversity on some levels is not really getting into the uh, discourses and debates around climate change adaptation and climate change development, and this is a handy way, if you like, <coughs> to draw attention to some of these issues. Um, around uh, conservation and its place in broader climate change adaptation uh, efforts. So there's two kinds of, if you like, um, ecosystem-based adaptation that we can talk about. We can talk about stuff which is explicitly designed as an ecosystem-based adaptation project, but if you think about using ecosystems for the purposes of human adaptation to, uh, <coughs> to climate change, of course, it's much wider, and there are a whole host of interventions and things that we already do which are relevant to ecosystem based adaptation. Everything from sustainable forest management, agroforestry, livelihoods diversification, integrated watershed management, uh, wetlands uh, restoration, floodplain management, rainfall management, etc., etc. All of these things can potentially be used to help human beings to adapt to climate change. So it's a term which, when you want to understand what, it's, what it means and its potential utility, you can't just look at projects which are explicitly framed in terms of it. You have to look at uh, relevant stuff that we already know about, if you like. And, and again, that sort of, it's not quite a catch all term, but it catches quite a lot. And um, it has, in many of its guises, not necessarily all, but many of its guises, a kind of focus on the win-win, which I'm sure you would have seen in other 
problem with sort of environment and development of discourses. Um, in one particular frame, it's actually uh, seen as a quadruple win, uh, a win for climate change adaptation and mitigation, a win for socio-economic development, a win for environmental protection and biodiversity conservation, and a win for contributing to sustainable economic development. So there's been a lot of enthusiasm around this <coughs> and the expression of that enthusiasm uh, sounds, at least to me, sort of quite familiar because when you look at the emergence of the term sustainable development itself, there was a lot of uh, focus on the win-win uh, scenario. This is how we started to think about trying to do conservation and development simultaneously because the idea was that you could that you could do that and that doing them together would be more effective than, than, than separately, which does sound quite commonsensical. In fact, it has a sort of you know motherhood and apple pie kind of intuitive appeal, but it's, it's hard to resist in some ways. Um, but as we probably know as well, sustainable development is a term which has been robustly contested uh, and it's been called everything from an oxymoron to a con, coming back to the title, uh, that was, we have a, a, in the abstract sense actually, so it's Johan Pottier, it's actually from a, a paper by John Potter, who asked this question in, in, in an opinion piece, are we being conned by sustainable development? Is it really something, uh, is, it, is it really, you know, can we achieve it, are we doing it? Um, it, is it just a term which is being used to cover a variety of activities? which are not sustainable and are really not even developers. Um, so I guess I just want to signpost at this point some of the caution um, and sort of alarm bells, if you like, that might ring if you historicize uh, this, this term a little bit and look back at some of the other uh, discourses that, that it's, it's related to and indeed has been prefigured by. Now, What's also interesting about the ecosystem based adaptation um, debates is that there, as I say, there's a lot of enthusiasm around the term. And perhaps this is understandable because whenever people think of a new term, they get quite excited about it and quite, and quite excited about the prospects. And perhaps it takes a bit longer to start to realize some of the pitfalls um, as well. But what you see right now um, from, you know, uh, for example, if you look at the, the the, the systematic review that's been done by Oswald et al. in 2014, which reviews pretty much everything related to EBA, um, it argues that there are more claims to hypothetical benefits than there is uh, empirical evidence of benefits from ecosystems based adaptation, you know, explicit framed interventions, or ones which are relevant to the purposes and the objectives of, of EBA. And there are also some gaps in the evidence. Uh, that review identifies, in which we've added a couple of things to here. So they argue that there's not much on um, the cost of EBA, uh, we would add that there's not much on the understanding of the idea of the trade off, we'll come back to that idea. There's not much in the way of participatory analysis, and um, there is nothing that I've seen so far on political and ecology perspectives. Um, and there's a surprising I don't know, there's a surprising silence on the relationship between ecosystems based adaptation and payments for ecosystem services, given that um, payments for ecosystem services are one of the, the main ways in which you might um, bring about um, ecosystem based um, adaptation. So, the research that we're doing in, in Mexico um, uh, is on populations who are living in or adjacent to protected areas. Um, along the Sierra Madre Oriental, uh, which I'll show you now, it's a mountain chain, uh, and we're trying to fill um, some of, of these gaps, and that's what I'm going to try and uh, take you through today. But of course, before uh, I can tell you what the gaps are, we need to tell you a little bit about the place at the beginning we've done this research in, back in uh, 2012 and 2013. So, um, <clears throat> you can't quite see it here, um, but the Sierra Madre Oriental is a mountain range. You can see little bits of it running uh, not too far from the eastern Mexican coast and uh, sort of downwards in a, a north-south direction, over which on this map has been transposed um, a series of little 
green and sorry, or rather purple and uh, yellow and uh, blue blobs, which demarcate the boundaries of protected areas which either have been established or are going to be established, with a view to establishing a biological corridor running across large parts of the Sierra Madre Oriental. So. The thing about Mexican protected areas is that there are lots of people living in and adjacent to them in a way that you don't always get in other countries because of the sort of land tenure situation in Mexico. I don't know if you know much about the history of Mexico, but um, in the early 20th century there was a revolution. Um, one of the fundamental aims of which I'm not going to go into the whole revolution now was to establish uh, Land, collective land ownership, which was brought about through a common land tenure category called an ejido. This literally means that uh, a bunch of people, rather than just an individual, own a piece of land. And so, if you want to establish a protected area, when you go into a place and you're talking with the people who live there, you're talking to the landowners. And it makes conservation, therefore, even with the weight of legislation on how people can use that land and how they cannot use that land. It makes it a necessarily more sort of a <laughs> negotiated process than it might be in other places. You know, I mean, I've studied it in Argentina, for example, and it's much easier to establish a protected area than to kick out if they are there. You can't really do that very easily in, in Mexico. Not as easy anyway. But there are these protected areas, and, uh, and Guanam, the, the Mexican uh, National Commission for Natural Protected Areas, is relatively adept at working with the local people because, because it has to. And um, if it wants its um, biological corridor uh, to, to, to work, it needs to get buy-in from people. And one of the big issues for Gonamp right now is working out um, what to do about climate change. And this is also something that the funders of this project, GIZ, were interested to, to find out more about. So if you're wanting to deal with adaptation, you need, in the first instance, to understand the vulnerability to climate impacts of the area and so poor people who, uh, <coughs> where, where the interventions will take place. So step one of the, of the project that, that um, Gwenham, um, got commissioned and then got paid, uh, got money from GIZ to go and do, was to conduct an interdisciplinary multi scale vulnerability analysis in order to identify the ecosystem based adaptation measures to reduce vulnerability. From the very beginning, they were quite interested in, well, it's an interesting question. They were open to this framing of ecosystem based adaptation. It's certainly something that funded GIZ, which organized for some of the big sort of uh, ecosystem based adaptation thinkers to provide sort of a a framing, a conceptual framing for the project to hang on. Um, they, they were very keen to, to, to introduce um, ecosystems based adaptation um, ideas. Now, it really was quite an ambitious uh, project um, because the vulnerability analysis was supposed to be across the whole of the Sierra Madre and Dan, so going from that sort of regional level. Um, right down through to the local level, um, it was supposed to identify the well, supposed vulnerability of the ecosystems in question to, to climate change, what was going to change in the ecosystems. But on the other side of it, because there are all these people living across these protected areas, what is the human vulnerability? And that's um, what my team was involved with. We were one of the well, we were responsible for several of the, of, the, of the 16 tasks, but they all clustered around understanding vulnerability to climate impact at the local level. Um, so we actually went over time to, to five different places. Um, today we've only got time to discuss two of those. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so the ones that I'll take you through, you can see photos of some of the people who did the research with. Uh, first in La Trinidad, which is up here, that's uh, uh, one of the smaller field sites and then a bigger field site, Laguna del Mante, both in the province of autonomous Potosi in, in, in Mexico. Um, so, uh, I explained, yes, you've got the idea. There's a big vulnerability analysis of really a real part to it, and it was, this is another presentation and another story. It was much more what <laughs> the coordinator term was multidisciplinary, which is many disciplinary, as opposed to us sitting down 
banging our heads together and coming, coming up with a, an interdisciplinary methodology which would you know, go across all of the tasks. That's a massively ambitious thing to do, not least in a research consultancy like, like this work that um, basically was. So I'm going to tell you about our little tasks. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what was behind our thinking on vulnerability. And it's pretty sort of classic old school political ecology, if you like. We're going, we went, uh, because we were working with Terry Cannon, who's one of the authors of the Cash Women's uh, Framework. Have you come across that book at risk just yet? No? Okay, classic in the field of political um, ecology, uh, even though that's a field that in the second edition of the book, the authors slightly disavow, but it, it's it's quite controversial to, to to take it outside of political ecology, obviously, because it, it relates to some of the core concerns as the as this approach to the developers play. So anyway, um, I won't get into questions about whether it is political or isn't political ecology, but it's definitely not of this co-produced socio-natural irreducibility, you have to study it all in one go, can't really say one thing is just one thing because it's always just more than one thing, network kind of thinking. This is this is uh, not that kind of approach to political ecology. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, by the way, with that, you'll have to come to the first lecture of the political ecology and development course uh, next January, which you, I'm not quite sure how, how much you guys are keyed in to the related around political ecology just, just yet. But if that, all that socio nature stuff is going on above your head right now, don't worry, put it to one side, come on in January, I'll explain it to you there. So, anyway, <clears throat> going back to the pressure and release. Um, model. It's grounded in a logic of the progression of vulnerability. That is that if you want to understand vulnerability at a local level, you have to look at what's happening at other levels, uh, you know, throughout um, geographically speaking and if you like societally, jurisdictionally speaking as well, to, to some of the root causes which uh, are, you know, are, are flowing through any particular Place. You can't just look at the, the, at the local picture. So you've got issues like um, power relations, environmental trends, debt crises, carbon-based growth, um, and you know the, the, the broader, if you like, political economy of what's happening um, in, in Mexico, playing into social structures and power systems around class, gender, and ethnicity, um, dimensions of vulnerability um, around livelihood strategies, well-being, individual capacity, collective capacity, and, and governance. These are the these are the sort of the ways in which we conceptualize vulnerability at the, the local level and we built a, a participatory toolkit to go and find out what these look like um, at the local level. So um, <clears throat> we've replaced the word disaster, which you normally see in this framework with outcomes, because with climate change impacts, sometimes you have a very clearly delineated a disaster that, that happens after, say, a flood um, or a, you know, like a, uh, like a you know, hurricane or whatever, you know, that, or a tsunami, for example. But you don't always have that. You have rapid and slow onset impacts. You have things which, um, where there's no clear disaster, it's just a chronically bad situation. And on the other side, you've got uh, environmental hazards such as flood, cyclone, drought, landslide, land heat wave. All putting pressure, which then gives rise to these outcomes. With climate change, if you like, sort of being one of the, the underlying conditions which impacts um, all of these, um, because because of the the, the, the nature and the uh, truly global character uh, and scope of what climate change itself. So, as I say, we used um, the. Dimensions of vulnerability from the screen up again, so you can see livelihood strategies, well being, individual capacity, collective capacity, and governance to, um, to turn into a, a, a participatory toolkit using um, sort of uh, group work and individual interviews and sometimes participant observation when we probably had the, the opportunity, uh, although we didn't have a huge amount of time in the work, but we had maybe two months, which was cool. Um, and we tried to understand for which. For which for the particular dimension of vulnerability, which of the tools would be best to use? So, for example, trying to understand the livelihood strategies dimensions of vulnerability, we found the transit awards were quite good because it gives you not just a sense of what people are doing for their livelihoods, but the geographical terrain across which that is taking place and the rather uneven character of exposure, for example, to, to, to physical hazards that, that can accompany that. So, for example, 
some people who in a village might be living in a floodplain, and some people who might not be living in a floodplain, uh, you know, because they're a little bit fur further up the, the slope or whatever, you can get some of this stuff and start to understand some of the geographical manifestations of, of uneven distributions of vulnerability um, through a transect world. I won't go through every method to say what we're looking for today, but the kinds of things that you can, you can get. Hey, you there. Um, so, um, <coughs> but that's what we were basically trying uh, to do. Uh, sorry, Peter, you were sneezing in this uh, similar talk to this uh, already. Uh, I'll only say half an hour, sorry. Uh, so that's no problem. So, um, okay, so I've taken you through the, the, the basic participatory methodology that we wanted to employ. Is, is it clear what I've been saying? Are there any questions or clarifications that are a bit confusing? Is it okay so far? Okay, okay. So, these, uh, that was the framework, these are the methods we are trying to employ, uh, and this is one of the field sets left in there, which was in our forest reserve um, in the district of Gilitla in, in the province of San Luis Potosí in, in Mexico. So you, this was the, uh, the forest reserve here, and this is the ejido, that's the common, communal land, uh, commonly owned piece of land. Uh, of La Trinidad, one of the uh, one of our field sites, as I say. And um, let me just say a little bit about the history of this place first before we get on to some of the climate impacts there. There's only about 100 people there, Linda, Linda, and Ness, and they established um, this settlement in the 1960s before then being able to claim the land as an ejido. And there's been a huge amount of self selection in terms of the, the people and the activities that go on there. So you, it's, a, it's a really hard place to live. It's been a, you know, a long time getting some of the basic services like having water and even electricity for, for some of the time. And you've, uh, you've had people who are, um, you know, who, who are, who've been practicing uh, livestock farming, cultivation, for example, and then using some of the resources of the forest uh, that the local activities, chalk and, and timber uh, selling, for example. So, um, it's a place where only the hardy tend to stay, and a place where, if you like, you already have quite a lot of um, adaptive capacity, but also a, a very strong sense of, of group identity, which lends itself to being able to deal with some pretty, pretty scary stuff that, they, that these guys have lived through and, and remain there for. So, um, in terms of uh, you know, the, the impacts that you have, and then the, the, sort of the level of violence and adaptation in that in the, uh, the main impacts that people identified were fires, hurricanes, frosts, pests, heavy rainfall, uh, and, and water availability. And there's not necessarily huge individual uh, sort of adaptive and coping capacity across the board, across all of these, but there is a, a very interesting level of, of collective capacity. Um, in relation to some of the, the sort of existential issues that people have, have gone through. So, for example, um, there was a, a hurricane in 1994 which completely flattened the settlement and people had to go and live elsewhere for a while. Whilst this was happening, the, uh, the municipal government was actually trying to make this permanent because there was a part of the municipal government, some pretty hardcore ecologists who thought that this forest reserve should not be inhabited and um, you should kick the people out and hey what a great opportunity because they've all had to move out anyway so how do we keep them out um, the the people uh, in left being there bypassed that level of government went to the um, the governor of the province and promised him their votes in elections in return for support to stay where they were. So, uh, and, and they did this with the help of NGOs, and it was not just like they, they just had this thought themselves, but this was something that, if you like, shows a level of um, collective capacity, not just the climate impact at all, but, but more broadly, which um, explains uh, some other things that, that, that we'll see in terms of uh, ecosystems based um, adaptation. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's, that, that's, the, that's the main point that I, I want to, to make here, although they also face some, some difficult 
constraints around dealing with some of the issues they have, like pests, because they live in a protected area. So <coughs> if pests in, in their crops, it's not really a great thing you can you can do in terms of using things like pesticides. And some of the uh, also just getting access to some of the uh, you know, extension uh, from from the extension uh, agricultural extension ministry is very difficult to do because it's blocked by the local staff of Gonam, the National Protective Areas Commission. Um, so that even if you wanted to use <laughs> pesticides or things that might fit, as sometimes people do in other national parks, they didn't really have access to that because the good relationships they had with Gonam came with that particular trade-off of, of not having that level of access. So um, it's a kind of an interesting background then of, of the way in which the settlement has developed, which can help you to understand some of what they have been doing collectively uh, in, the, in the past few years. And you might term this category which means to live from, um, from, from the forest, uh, and entails a switch in your livelihoods away from agriculture towards payments for ecosystem services and um, ecotourism um, to the point where some people have managed not to have to get involved in sort of seasonal migration which comes every year in, in the kind of, I don't know if you've read anything about sort of agricultural, agricultural migra migratory labour in Mexico, but it's really not fun. It's not something you would sign up to voluntarily. <clears throat> and there's some people who are managing to avoid it because of um, stuff that is very relevant to ecosystems-based adaptation. So through their good relationships with Gonang, they've managed to, to get an ecotourism project set up. It's not necessarily paying very many people very much right now, but it does provide livelihoods for some for some of uh, the, the year. Um, there are people who get employment in temporary employment programs to do um, stuff which is very relevant to, to, to you. Uh, it's basically payments for ecosystem services. So you have people who maintain a, a fire gap, for example. You have people who are working with some of the the pests which are, uh, are bothering uh, some of the, the, the trees at the moment. You have a, a number of, of opportunities for people who um, can then, as I say, switch their livelihood um, away. And um, it's it's not something that necessarily works for everyone, but it's interesting. But actually, in this context, depending upon continued support and funds available for payments for ecosystem services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is a viable livelihood strategy for quite a lot of the community, and the community leaders are very much invested in this, to the extent that you see forests returning to formerly agricultural plots. So, uh, I mean, some of that would happen anyway because some of the conservation is shifting conservation, but, but there is less agricultural land now than, than there used to be. And this is in their own ejido, which they own, right? <laughs> so, and, and which they've been able to, you know, that the ownership has permitted them to do agriculture in, in a forest or in that, even though that's technically illegal. But of course, there are, there are trade offs as well in that community. Uh, and one of these is the underrepresentation of women in collective decision making processes. So, we organized our focus groups for men and for women separately, and the women were very grateful for this because it gave them, the, according to them, the first chance to have where people had come from outside and asked them specifically what was going on for them specifically without there being men in the room. And some of the stuff that came out of that was, was that women had fewer opportunities to get um, uh, employed by the temporary employment program you know, working on the fire uh, uh, gaps for example they uh, because there was this argument that women should be in the household looking after the children and they bring their children and they work on on the fire gap and that's wrong because it's it's not fair and you know, that there isn't a discussion about is there another way of looking after the children or it can this be in some way incorporated into the work etc cetera, etc cetera. but these kinds of concerns um, show that not everyone uh, gets to make the same level of decisions about the strategy for Vivian and Bosque. Some of the older people were not really convinced by ecotourism and payments for ecosystem services because they could see that they couldn't keep as much livestock, they couldn't 
sell the stuff they used to go and get from the forest, however illegally, uh, and they had less autonomy to pick their livelihood strategies. So uh, it was something that worked for quite a lot of people, but of course, you know, you're never going to find something that works for everyone. Either. So, and then, as I've said, we used access to other government agencies like SAWAPA, which is the Agricultural Extension Agency, and associated adaptation options and support around the agricultural activities that remained important to some people's livelihood strategy. There was no discussion about can we do adaptation around that, because that set of uh, relationships was kind of off the table. So, uh, but I guess the, the, the message here is that actually some stuff that looks like uh, that is relevant to ecosystem-based adaptation can actually work at this very small scale and was providing some interesting writing options for at least some of all of these caveats not understanding. So our other field site that I want to talk about is La Wuro Mandi. It's a it's a biosphere reserve um, in the district of El Alto Chipa, also in uh, uh, San Luis Potosí, and um, <coughs> it's a much bigger field site. There's about sort of three thousand, four thousand people there, um, perhaps. And again, it's an ejido, commonly owned, um, but the land tenure there is a bit more complicated because. According to you know, in line with some of the liberalization reforms that happened in Mexico in the 1990s and the 2000s, some of this land was effectively privatized. There were bits of it were portioned off, people were given individual titles, and they could keep it or they could sell it. And that's uh, something that's uh, characterized the, the sort of the land ownership relations that, that, that you find here. So um, a lot of the livelihood activities that you, you have there are around um, agriculture, and um, it's much easier to, to do agriculture there because it's so much flatter. So it's, it's at one of the bottom, uh, well, it's at valley bottom. Um, and there's quite a lot of space uh, available for the you know, sugarcane plantation, is very common. There's a big citrus plantation not too far away from, from, from the lake here, which is also within the ejido. But you'll see also that overlapping. This green line here is the uh, the protected national area of El Alto Chipa. So it's a biosphere reserve. Do you know what biosphere reserves are and how they work? So you have a you can have a nucleus zone where you can't touch or really do anything. You might be able to go for a walk around there, but that's pretty much all you can do. Then you have the sort of buffer zone areas, which are supposed to be areas where you can't really do very much and much of that land thing would be a buffer zone, and then you have these supposedly you know, areas for sustainable livelihood sort of production, if you like, where you can do stuff, and ideally it's, it's deemed to be sustainable in environmental terms. Um, but there's quite a lot of overlap here, so that the, the Gornan have uh, you know, discretion over what happens here and to some extent what happens around, but of course because of the ownership of uh, <laughs> Um, arrangements, there is also scope for all of these agricultural activities, even if they're technically not uh, a process. So, um, oh, just one thing as well about the livelihood activities, not everyone's doing that because people who don't have big portions of land often don't have agricultural livelihoods. They might be selling things by the side of the road. You can't really see the road here, but there's a, there's a big tarmac road which comes out. So this is where it comes out to it, basically. And you might sell things, you might work in one of the nearby cities, like you know, Rajas, for example, and then commute and, and, and go and, and, and live here. Um, and uh, it, it very much translates around sort of land ownership. If you're a, if you are a land owner, you're known as an ejida dario. If you are not, you're known as an avecindado, which is a sort of a neighbor, if you like. But, with, in a way which implies that you're not a landowner and that you've moved to landowner and after the point at which the people who were living there originally were given this land. Okay, so um, the main impacts um, that people identified in Mante are relating to uh, droughts, fires, pests and disease and, um, and heavy rainfall. And, um, Again, through these impacts, you can, you can start to get a handle on what is it locally and individually and household level that people are, are able to do, and what is it that they're able to do sort of collectively. And I would argue that the collective 
um, negotiating power that they have is much less than uh, and much less uh, well organized than you find in in La Trinidad. But there are you know, things that people can do. So there's a there's a there's a real issue around um, irrigation. You know, we saw in the picture back here. It's not as if they're lacking water. But a lot of the water is used by the citrus plantation, which is a privately owned company, in which some people can go and uh, get, get work on. But also the level of water tends to be um, quite low in relation to flood management strategies for the nearest city, Ciudad Valles. So in order for that not to flood, the water levels here remain lower than they could be, and it's seen as a constraint on local agricultural um, production, if you like. So, there's an issue uh, there around uh, around that, and you know, there are there's much more um, access of Sawadba, which has a different relation with a particular staff or Gornam in that in in Laguna Manca article. That you know, there's much more space for those guys to come in, and it helps with some kind of collective capacity because they do have that sort of state uh, recourse as well. Um, there are fires, um, and this is partly because of the ways in which people clear land in order to, to, um, to, to start the cultivation process. And it offers, if you like, um, there is adaptive capacity offered um, through the construction of fire breaks and um, you know, to contain the local fires. There's a local fire brigade, all of which are basically payments for ecosystem services, uh, which are, you know, there, are, there are grants available to people who are ethnic diverse as you know, land owners. Um, to, to get involved in these kinds of jobs and to be paid for helping to look after the, the, the nucleus zone of, of the biosphere reserve itself. Um, so there is a sort of mixed picture when it comes to the levels of vulnerability and adaptive capacity. And um, yeah, here we go, this slide sort of says <laughs> so, uh, some of the other stuff that I. Uh, that I've been saying that, that there is sort of potential for, for ecosystem space adaptation in the because, because of these tools like the Lincoln Fire Break, break the Fire Brigade, salaries, petroleum monitoring within um, the biosphere reserve itself. So, um, you again, you see something which provides something of a livelihood activity for some people to get involved in. Um, in, in stuff which helps them with um, adapting to climate impact because when you have, I guess, if you have money, for example, and you don't have to depend so much on very climate sensitive agricultural livelihoods, but, you know, it could be argued that you have a, you have a greater sort of level of flexibility, you have a sort of fallback if, uh, if your sugarcane crop doesn't do very well, for example. So, um, there are some interesting things going on which look like ecosystem space adaptation and which help some people. Bearing in mind that these are people, I guess, mainly with a, an agricultural profile. And those who don't work in agriculture have a different vulnerability profile, which is much where you, you see just the general soaring heat temperatures as something which are much more problematic for them in terms of actually just being able to do their jobs because it's so hot. Um, than uh, for the people who are working in agriculture, although obviously that's an issue for those guys too, perhaps even more so. But again, there are costs and trade-offs to ecosystems-based relevant interventions in um, land um, and And one of the biggest of these is that the payments to the households are quite modest. And um, you know, you, if, if you are uh, if you are someone who receives these payments, and you have to be an Akila Daniel, if you're an Alessim Daniel, if you don't know any land, you don't get any payments. So a huge proportion of the population, perhaps the majority of the population, doesn't get any payments for doing conservation in ways which help them with their own adaptive capacity. Um, and even if you do get payments, it's maybe 500 Mexican pesos a year. If you compare that to the say, returns from expanding the agricultural frontier, which is what quite a lot of people would prefer to do rather than having a biosphere reserve there, um, you know, they, they look quite modest. Um, and there's no scope to expand the payments because La Buena Manta has already been quite successful in, in attracting payments for ecosystem services grants. So you can't increase the level of, of, of money that's going in there 
and you're raising the question, is this sufficient incentive of the behavioral change that you are asking people to become responsible for and, and, and to do? Um, are you giving someone sufficient incentive to, to, to buy into ecosystems data and adaptation? There's a prior question to that. How many people even know about payments for ecosystem services in the market? The answer is not very many. So, um, you know, it, there are ways in which this does nothing to, to modify behavior by people both Ejira Daniels and Avesim Daros who go into the reserve and they chop down, you know, sort of uh, very protected, very supposedly fragile uh, species. They do all kinds of things that they're not supposed to do because actually it's a source of food, it's a source of wood, etc., etc. They've got no incentive at all to, to, to buy into this stuff. And this, by the way, if you're wondering who this guy is, this guy is called Mark Dean. He's one of the Rombedas, one of the firemen who gets paid to go and put out fires. Very, and he's also an Ahila Daniel who owns land in this area. And he's representative of one of the people who get the most benefits from, from, uh, from ecosystems-based adaptation. And there is an issue there around, as I say, mainly land ownership, which really constrains that. But even he is limited in what he wants to do because he would like to um, expand the production of some of these plants you can see behind me, which are ponytail plants. And he's not allowed to because I think it's classed as an invasive species, not a native species anymore, an introduced species. And even though he thinks that there is a market for these kinds uh, of plants, a local market for it, which he has the land to grow and to try and meet some of that market demand. He's not allowed to because um, it's not constituted as a, as a form of biodiversity which is worth, you know, cultivating or conserving in, in, in any ways. He, even he, as one of the people who benefits most from ecosystems-based adaptation relevant interventions in this area, even he is not really involved in any kind of decision about what constitutes biodiversity worth conserving. You can say the same for all the mangrove. So who's in control of defining what conservation is and the, the ways in which those particular forms of biodiversity should be the ones that we should use as the ecosystems on which we base adaptation for human beings. So he's, he's, he's completely out of that loop. So, um, how much more time have I got for you? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Oh, awesome. Okay. Right. So, in conclusion, I've only got one more. Or two slides now, okay, maybe just this, this one here. Um, Ecosystems based uh, adaptation relevant interventions worked on a pretty small scale with a bunch of people who already had quite a lot of adaptive capacity. So I, I don't, as I say, I don't want to, you know, rubbish ecosystems based adaptation here. To come back to the title of the talk, are we being conned uh, in the same way that John Potter was asking me about sustainable development? Uh, no, I don't think we are being conned. There are lots of things going on where, where conservation and other actors are genuinely trying to find ways in which people can be given good reasons to conserve biodiversity and ways in which it can work for them to get them away, away from quite immiserating um, conditions such as having to participate in agricultural, um, migrate, migratory agricultural labor uh, on, on a yearly basis. You know, nobody's really up for that, but, but, but some people have to do it. So I don't think it's a con, but from the evidence that we have, from the field sites that we went to, it only worked in these very specific conditions. And if you go to them in um, and other field sites as well, like I won't get into that. Um, you find this issue of not enough payments for ecosystems services, which, which you, as, as you might call it. Um, the payment and the other rewards or incentives that people might uh, be given aren't enough to justify the kinds of behaviour that is expected of them under this arrangement. It's not enough of it's for livelihood, um, and uh, there are other, you know, sufficiently strong uh, benefits for people to really to buy into it, or for it to make a difference to the conservation state uh, of Lemon of land. If you want to explain that conservation state, you can't do it in terms of the ecosystem-based adaptation relevant measures that are on offer. It, it, 
to the extent that there is a conservation state there, and it is quite good, it is for other reasons. So, and this is interesting because it's one of the ways in which you can see very obviously that the ecosystem space adaptation literature hasn't picked up on this potentially critical flaw or problem for ecosystems based adaptation, which we've known about for 20 years. I, I don't know if anybody of you have ever come across the literature on integrated conservation and development, which I referred to briefly at the start of the talk. It was the poster child of sustainable development in the 1990s. Community based tourism or community based natural resource management or community conservation of one guise or another was showing us how you could do conservation and development together by valuing local people, by allowing them to participate, by allowing them to get involved in conservation and doing forms of conservation, which gave them a reason to be involved in the first place. And there were uh, a lot of programs which were trying and still are trying to do that in, in ways which often are very valuable and very valued, but which often came across this problem of insufficient incentive, often in um, a sort of a financial guise. If, if you look at some of the literature on, for example, Campfire, anybody heard of Campfire? Communal Areas Programme, but in, uh, Communal, areas, Communal Areas Management Programme for Indigenous Resources in Zimbabwe, one of the flagships of what is known as community based natural resource management, um, that uh, was supposed to be you know, making the case, actually was found not to deliver enough money to people for them to decide to take up some of the conservation. Uh, objectives that, that were being proposed around, for example, trying to use uh, wildlife um, for tourism or for hunting, for, you know, for, for, for trophy hunting, as opposed to killing them off and having a livestock there instead. So, um, this is not new, but it doesn't come in to the ecosystem based adaptation literature at all, but it's coming up in sites where people are doing stuff, which is supposed to be ecosystem based adaptation. And it's a bit um, you know, it's very depressing in a way. This is wealth of literature. We know what some of the issues are. There have been some people who really tried to wrap their head around them and suggest some ways which we might move forward, um, but it's not there. And it all comes um, down, it doesn't all come down to it, but one of the important things to realise here is, is that the concept of trade-off is much more helpful in understanding um, what happens in efforts and projects which try to do conservation and development simultaneously, then is the idea of win-win or synergy. You don't find so many pro uh, projects which achieve that synergy, you find an awful lot of them which don't, and it's about what are the trade-offs and what are the consequences of those trade-offs between conservation and development initiatives, and where, what are the implications of that for what you're trying to do, or what people are trying um, to do. So uh, there's a, you know, uh, one of the recent debates around this, the new conservation a debate with Miller, Mintia, McShane, people uh, like this, who some of whom have been, who were involved in the first wave of integrated conservation development and trying to use his insights to come up with another new conservation that was perhaps too frequently applied. Um, you know, there's a wealth of, of, of detail there to, to, and to, 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 um, to explore and, and to help people trying to get their heads around ecosystems based adaptation if we can maybe do a bit more to point it out to them or whatever it is that we need to do. But there's another question here um, which I think that it would be helpful for people um, working on ecosystems based adaptation to ask themselves a bit more deeply. And that is, why are these trade-offs um, so long ago? Why are we still seeing the same trade-offs now with similarly sometimes disastrous implications for the kinds of things that we're trying to do, as we were seeing back in the 1980s and the 1990s with, with integrated conservation and, and well, and the 70s and the 2000s as well. Um, and I would argue that this has a lot to do with the globally predominant uh, neoliberal political um, economy uh, that, that, that we are faced in. I, I guess the question is, put at its most bold, if you want to reconcile conservation and development, if you want to see these win-win scenarios, is the system in which you're trying to do that making those a marginal outcome or a much likelier outcome? And can you use um, a sort of, you know, a neoliberal uh, model of, of, of global capitalism 
to solve the problems which a neoliberal model of global capitalism is so fundamentally implicated in producing in the first place? That's the big question here. I'm not going to give you an answer to that question. Uh, it might be interesting for us to take it up and see what you think about it in the questions and the discussions. Um, but you don't see that kind of engagement in the ecosystems-based adaptation literature. Um, and I think this is sort of the next step in research around ecosystems-based adaptation, is to start to, to look into the ways in which its own objectives are being affected um, by the fact that it's operating with a, a global neoliberal capitalist system, if you like. If I can use the word system, because a lot of people are not very happy about that, I will use it. Um, yeah, so I think I will, uh, I think that's my, my big message. I think the paper that we're trying to do is trying to contribute to this um, uh, and get this research agenda going if we can convince the reviewers that it is a valid research agenda, which we're having some issues with right now. Um, but um, yeah, that's the basic uh, sort of, uh, message on this. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Andy, for the interesting talk. Uh, so, we have big questions, no? Um, we do have any questions to. Okay. Hi, uh, thanks very much for that. That was interesting. Um, I, on the last point that you made, um, well, I should say that I work for the University of Cambridge. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, I come from a practitioner perspective. Yeah. And I'm just thinking on this last point, I mean, being somewhat familiar with, you know, the political ecology approach and it's very critical and, you know, thought provoking and everything. But what does that, you know, your last kind of big question, how can that be translated into practice and for practitioners? I mean, if you're saying, I mean, I've worked on EBA projects myself and I'm currently still involved in them. And mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, you know, I realize that your point on trade-offs, accepting that EBA is the panacea and that it's not going to be great for everyone and for everything. Yeah. Um, but we are operating the system that we're operating in, sure. that we have to. And so even if we accept these, this kind of, you know, thinking of it more as trade-offs, what does your last question mean in more practical terms? And if you had to sort of communicate that to practitioners. <laughs> then what would it look like? Um, sure, okay. I mean, uh, of course, if you're working in one ecosystem space adaptation project in a different part of the world, you know, it's not exactly going to be the site of revolution for the overthrow of global capitalism, yes, of course. And um, in some ways, you know, I can make some suggestions. I think it's a question that we all sort of have to, to think about to an extent. And, and it is an open question. There are some political ecologists who would just say, of course, neoliberal capitalism is the, is the, the basic cause of the, the world's biggest environmental and development problems as well. It's the greatest cause of inequality, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I guess my own feeling is that it's, a, it's an open question. So, First, I would encourage debate around this. Do, do we think that capitalism can be reformed? And what are the implications of what we're doing, say, as practitioners or as researchers, in terms of supporting the system and trying to figure out, and what is that the kind of support that we want to see in it? And how does that affect what we're actually doing and how we are trying to do it? So I, I would say that the question to look through um, where you stand first of all, and what you are contributing to in the implementation and design of your projects as they currently stand. There are some much, um, if you like, more tangible and immediate, uh, although I think that's a fairly immediate thing to do, but there are other immediate things that I would argue that you can do. Um, one of which is to throw open this question to a much broader, broader group of people. <coughs> what constitutes conservation? What constitutes biodiversity that is worth conserving? Who gets to define a conservation landscape? How do we have a different conversation around that? Um, <clears throat> that's a long-term you know, goal and objective, which uh, again raises this question of, of what are we trying um, to, to, to do here and who do we, who do we need to involve um, in it? Um, another thing that is worth doing and which, 
to some extent, there's some, I guess, some hope, if you like, in terms of uh, looking at payments which based system of services. Now, some people are quite critical of payments which based system of services because they see them as some kind of tool of the market. You know, it's all about the market paying, putting a price on, you know, uh, a landscape which has intrinsic value or worth in, in all kinds of ways that money just cannot capture. But a lot of, as you probably know about my idea, a lot of payments which based systems is actually paid for by the state. And for me, it raises the question, um, within broader conservation uh, uh, thinking, what is the role of the state in conservation and development? And um, in the context of a sort of, you know, we all know one of the tenets of a neoliberal sort of policy agenda is to reduce the role of the state and to use market mechanisms to answer as many questions as possible, to do as many things as possible, if you like. That's why, apparently, we're using the EU right now. It's, it's one of the reasons why there's a big pushback in Britain and in, in the United States, as we've seen quite recently, about some of the implications of, a, of, a, of free trade for, for some people's livelihoods. So, what is the role of the state? And given that the role of the state in payments for ecosystem services is actually quite strong right now, what kind of relationship does it have with the private sector? What kind of relationship does it have with the market? And what kinds of activities uh, are those relationships supporting? And again, who is getting to make decisions in all of this and looking at all of those answers? So, of course, it's not a sort of panacea answer to your, to your question. And I don't want to, you know, I don't think in the ecosystem space that I think it's a con. Um, I just would like us to, you know, consider some of these things a bit, a bit more. Just deep, is that a reasonable answer to your question? Yeah. I have another one, but I don't want to go. <laughs> well, you come uh, okay, yeah, it's just um, related to the payments for ecosystem services. So you've been all of your case studies included payments for ecosystem services rather than other EBA approaches, such as actual you know approaches using different ecosystem um, strategies to reduce you know. Fires or landslides, and I can't remember all the examples of the hazards that you listed. Um, and yeah, so, well, one of my, based on my first question is basically um, in, in your involvement with this, had GIZ, um, with, were those the payment for ecosystem services, um, were they implemented by GIZ? Evaluation, or were you then also working with GIZ to figure out which EBA option would be more appropriate than the current um, payment for ecosystem services scheme that they're using? And then also another question if, if that were the case, then um, I mean, will they be looking into implementing other EBA options rather than focusing just on the livelihood component, which I, I think is a very important one? Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, EBA should also include a suite of, let's say, ecological um, solutions to some of the, the hazards outlined. Okay, um, so um, I don't know is the answer. Um, I guess it, we, we looked at what was already there and we made some recommendations around um, the adaptation options. Some of what they do already does address some of those threats. So for example, um, in Laguna de Mante, some of the fire breaks, and actually in La Tumila, uh, they, they help contain the sorts of fires which really are sort of you know, real threats to people and of course to biodiversity um, in the area. And in, there's in some ways less you can do with the hurricanes, arguably, I guess, if there's a greater forest cover, which in La Tumila there is these days, uh, but not in the, if you look at the settlement area itself, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there are EBA options for that that we could do that, that we didn't uh, look at so much. But I guess like, we were very focused on what people's livelihoods were and what you might do around that. It's possible that yes, they could go back and see if there was, um, a, you know, a sort of uh, ways to deal with the flooding that happened. Whether you know, people were quite able to deal with that when it wasn't extreme, um, and you might. Yeah, you know, they could probably think a lot more about things like hurricane chapters and stuff like that, although 
you talk about the ecosystem systems based adaptation. And if we're looking at ecosystem based adaptation, are we missing other options we might actually want to look at, which might be more appropriate for, for, for what people most need, even if it's easier than you know, a case to be looked at uh, in, in other contexts? Yeah, yeah, because I think that's just an important point to also keep in mind for future research and and um, looking at effectiveness is that I mean EBA isn't just applying with adoption that strengthens adaptive capacity, it's mm -hmm. it is also um, using ecosystems to sure, sure. you know it's, yeah. instead of hard infrastructure options yeah. to create adaptation. So um, I mean just because this was quite focused on payment for ecosystem services, which is just kind of subcomponent mm -hmm. of over EVA overall and the, the available options. Um, yeah, I think I think that's important to keep in mind and sort of making a statement of is this a con or is it effective or however you, you want to phrase it, um, because it is just quite small. And some let's say more hardcore EVA on the ecology side focused people would probably or would be more critical of just even calling payment and free services and EVA options. So I think mm -hmm. everyone in the community is sort of having these discussions, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's good to think of both sides or all of the, the suite of options, basically, in, in this question. Do you want to uh, yeah, well, so, uh, building on your, on your comments about the neoliberal capitalist system and why we wouldn't start in, the, in these communities. I was wondering if you had, if you could expand a bit more on like the, the, the short story on political agency that you gave, where like after the after the hurricane, and like in that, uh, how people sort of fought for them to return back and and. Um, yeah, how, how people are actually involved in shaping whether or not they stay and how they can stay in, in, in their lands and, and sure. negotiating their, their livelihoods with or against funders coming from the board. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so in, um, in Latin Liga, one of the main sort of focuses of collective action is what's called the Comisariado. Every ejido, that is on land, on the land, um, uh, portion of the land, is, has a Comisariado, which is the, the management committee hey, for, um, for, uh, for, for, for that piece of land. And so, it, and it's quite, you know, it's, it's, it's the committee, well, not the committee, but well, it's the committee to be on if you want to be involved in, in marshalling sort of the, the whole of the, the community. And I know that's a contested word, but there are so many collective processes which bind these people together, albeit in differentiated ways. I think it's legitimate to use that word. Um, and it is also, it's a legal, um, it's, it's, it's a body with a legal standing. So if you are a municipal government, or if you're a governor, you are dealing with a body which has a legal standing and which has, which funnels the coordinated action of a group of people, either you know, a large group of people or a, a local and important and powerful minority within that group. Uh, so you do have some legal crowd there. At the same time, from some of the early sort of efforts of the of the areas creation to try and you know, get some stuff going. I'm trying to get some people, some people to get away from agriculture. Um, Eco-tourism projects were set up, which brought in an NGO um, called Sierra Negra. And that NGO tried to run a few um, um, you know, projects, some of which were more successful than, than, than others. Um, I think they had a role in, in you know, giving a bit of counsel. Well, like these guys are giving you grief because they the ecological department of the municipal government are feeling that is on your back and they're really influential and they want this forest reserve to be pristine in, 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 the, you know, in the direct. Um, then these might be other options. So there was a process through which through, um, you know, I think that Sierra had a role in mediating the contact with an establishment so that people could then go and say, okay, this is what we need. We want to go back, 
and also enabling them to be well and, and to act upon their legal rights. Yeah, it's kind of like a random fixed based approach here. One of the original rights based approaches is the Aquila system in Mexico. So um, it, it's, it's through a collective capacity to defend your, your legal rights through existing you know, legal mechanisms which, which has allowed um, people who had got their stuff together because they were planning to move, you know, to, to, to mount this resistance and to be able to strategize and get back into the you know, uh, you know it's, it's interesting, you know, that if you look at the relationship between Gornam, I mean, they've already tried very hard, you know, the guy who works there, he's got a very particular vision of conservation and what the landscape should look like, etc. but he's, you know, he was, was always pushing for women to get to the the dependency of ecosystem services sort of um, benefits and he's, he's sort of you know that they have a good enough relationship that even though he is a gatekeeper so he is the one who doesn't want um Sarantra, the export extension agency to come in even though they they come into a biosphere as well and the part which has possibly more restricted um, level activity than the category of national forest reserve um, and this is important in my own mind. You know, it, I, I guess that for, for the people who are on the bottom side of it, you also notice that they all get employment from the government's ecosystem services, which for everybody does. But there are things which work to some extent, to quite a large extent, across the community, but work particularly well to speak with people through you know, particular relations. Is that, is that right? Are there more questions? Um, I mean, you've spoken to this a little bit, um, but I'm wondering broadly how, um, you know, EDA and things like this in some sense um, interacts with sort of more rights based approaches to, um, you know, to conservation. And I mean, um, I guess I'm coming, coming at this from the perspective of uh, what I know about this in um, India and South mm. India, where um, it's probably a very different situation where you really don't have common property rights. You don't have a common land in your instead you have the state on the one hand and corporations on the other hand sort of squeezing forest dwellers off their land for conservation or for you know establishing mines. And um, now you have valuations of protected areas. And in a lot of the valuations of AAS discourse, um, local community representatives as users of ecosystem services. So um, they both protect, but they also pay for the use of, um, you know, firewood or collecting mm -hmm. minor forest produce. Uh, so it's kind of really taking things away from, you know, forest dwelling communities having rights to sure. the use of forest products to um, this sort of market uh, market uh, logic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm guessing that in Mexico it's very different because you did say that they have um, community land uh, land rights. Sure. And I think that's yeah, that that's really it. Is um, you know the the, the, the other rights based approach I'm aware of is actually not a conservation, it's in it's in social protection it's from India, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, where the right to food in the region to matter the way that you feel about hunger that, that, that has historically been in India, is mobilized, you know, um, to create a social protection program where people are guaranteed a hundred days of work every year, which can and does mean the difference between eating and not eating for I don't know how many millions of people. Um, could you use that for conservation uh, and development objectives? Oh, that's a good question. You could, as we've seen in a place like Mexico where there was a revolution, you can see that some of like there, there is something quite revolutionary about communal land ownership. If you look at the way it empowers people, once, once they know how to get hold of their rights and do something with it, with them, you know. Um, I'm struggling to think of, a, of, of another example. I might have to sort of, this is a really good question, I mean, it, could, could, you, could you do it in other places? I'm struggling to think, think of a place where it would be easy. I can think of some reasons where it would be difficult, and that is because conservation legislation is quite strong. And um, conservation legislation is often, not by any means always, based on, um, you know, the, either the exclusion of people from a particular area or the restriction of the activities that can happen 
uh, and then perhaps in combination with you know, using market mechanisms so that you know somebody pays for some kind of forest usage or some restriction. Um, uh, sometimes on, on, on the market itself, which is not always the case with some of these particular systems studies, as I said. So you might say in that way that it's, it's you know, that the people who most um, mobilize those rights are uh, conservationists and, and governments who have to maintain protected areas as protected. That the, the rights that, that's, you know, that there is a, a, a right to demand conservation. About you know, outcomes, which is is is, is effectively mobilised. I'm, I'm not saying that as a critique of conservation. I'm just saying that it's you know it kind of works in the other way to to the extent that you you don't have uh, you know a countervailing sort of rights claim, which then gives you this power of negotiation that to some extent communities in Mexico, the, the people in Mexico. Have and use in these um, processes related to conservation and development. How do they have and use the, the rights as in the quality institutions that um, they're responsible for the rights and who pays the ecosystem services through whom they have? Um, so, in the places where, where this was taking place, um, for the, in our field sites, um, the ecosystem's services were, the payment of credits were, were offered by the Mexican government. Um, sorry, this is part of your first question. Um, one, they weren't offered by, uh, it wasn't something like the Asian Global Environmental Facility Fund or any one of the other funders of, 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 um, of ecosystem based, uh, of payments for ecosystem uh, mm -hmm. services. Um, so um, it was whether you could get a government grant for it <coughs> or not. Um, then, um, in terms of the institutions which look after rights, as I said before, it's, it's, it goes through the Comisaria on the one hand, which is the, you know, the, the committee for the FIBA. It's people themselves who manage these rights because it's embedded in, in tenure situations. So you don't need, um, if you like, what, what's helping us sometimes when we have an NGO like Seattle or whatever, which reminds you of the things that you can do with the rights that you have and what rights you do have. Although people in Latin you know, America and Latin America will establish the appeal for themselves long before they had any intervention from anybody else because they saw the advantages that it could confer in terms of security of tenure. So, uh, I mean, the rights are in that way. You know, that, that I guess that there are organizations in Mexico, and this is going a bit beyond my knowledge, which probably would look at the ways in which these, these rights can be mobilized. Um, there's been a big, if you like, um, comparatively disempowering from the collective action point of view process of privatizing a lot of people, so that they're split up into particular blocks, and you don't get the same capacity for collective action because the commissariat is split between people who don't own the same land. Um, so it's not quite the same as, say, the, the National Rural Reform Guarantee Act, where there was a massive, as I understand it, and you know better than I do, um, there was a massive move uh, on the part of civil society to mobilise these rights to, to create something like you know, the, the, the Act and the, 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 the interventions that come out of it. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But I think any more questions? Sure. Um, it's just going back to the, 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 the title of the, um, the talk. Um, based on the research that you've done and the conclusions that you seem to have drawn up there, um, just wondering um, how do you justify your statement that you made earlier on that um, we're not being conned? I'm making a huge presumption that um, all of these systems um, are meant to duplicate themselves and somehow spread, um, perhaps countrywide or regionwide, and have a large impact on the majority of populations and, mm. and areas. And that this uh, EBA and a lot of other conservation systems are being used as uh, examples of this is the way to do it. So, um, so, how do I justify this? Not a con. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I 
you're, you're right about that. I, I haven't touched upon this, but um, the you know the 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 Gonam, they love this project. So they're like, oh wow, and like our, our vulnerability toolkit for participatory. Let me come back to that one a little bit because it's participatory up to a point. Um, sort of talk that they wanted to go and use it in order to identify ecosystem space adaptation measures across the whole of Mexico. And sadly, I lost, you know, I lost the opportunity to be to, to, to carry on working on that project at that, at that time. But it would have been a very interesting study. So I, it's also one which says that in some ways I can't completely refute that because I don't have an evidence base to say, well, what how does this work at the national level? My feeling from the field sites that we were in was that there was some stuff, there was some stuff in the thinking about ecosystem space adaptation, and there was stuff in there were things in the response to that thinking and the ways in which people were trying to operationalize it, which which were very genuine and which were paying very close attention to this idea of using ecosystems or, uh, as ways to help people adapt to climate impacts and genuinely to commit to going in first and having a big conversation about what some of the potential climate impacts were and what some of the things people wanted help with could be. And so I, I don't, it's not, it's not just some kind of, you know, this, this is sort of, if you like, uh, we can be a bit unfair towards conservation stuff, you sometimes we can have this sort of like image of the conservationist who just only cares about ecology and it doesn't really matter if there are people there, it doesn't really matter what the livelihood implications are because we have to save this part of the planet and if we don't do it, nobody else will. You know, it's, it, what, that's not the kind of conservationist that I was working with in, in Mexico on that project. There were people who genuinely cared about trying to make sure that, that you know, that people um, weren't quite so poor as, as they were in some of these field sites and that the, the conservation that um, they were doing was alive to some of these issues and, it, and if you wanted it in any case to have any traction in the places where you were working you had to bring these issues even into your conservation work you know my sense was that there were a lot of people who were genuinely committed to that kind of conservation working around this agenda um, and even if they would rather not have to do all that negotiation because local people were, were comparatively powerful and empowered by the landlords. Um, they, they were going to do it. So, and, and so what they're trying to do was to some extent addressing both um, climate adaptation and conservation objectives. So I don't know if that, that, I can't refute your whole point, but for me there was enough genuine interaction um, and in the wider UBA community of people in what terms of what, what UBA is supposed to be doing for me to think that, you know, it's very easy to write off terms like sustainable development and ecosystem space adaptation as some massive con which has already been um, sort of its meaning and the, 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 the logic through which it, it will unfold has already been fixed by a bunch of people who don't care about inequality and who don't care about the environment because they're really only concerned with the accumulation of capital. So I, I, I think yeah. Does that answer your question? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's a bigger question. Um, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Sure. Uh, but it's, um, it's, I think it's something that should be thought about. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are vested interests um, in the um, neoliberal um, mm -hmm. camp, in the conservation camp. Um, and of course, on a micro level, you might find that the people in the community will appreciate a lot of these interventions, but is it working? Does it actually have an, uh, the effect that it's meant to have? Is it um, just being sold to keep us um, sort of hoping that you know, something good's going to come out of it? In these field sites, some of it is working, some of it isn't. So it's not completely fine. How about that? <laughs> Interesting about so, so that's that I mean, you mentioned that um, some of the payments were able to uh, sufficient enough to, to incentivize um, cooperation for community okay. so how do you begin to to then build a whole livelihood like, structure from this sort of payment that, that's need, like that's not sufficient in the first place to incentivize consideration um, and also think about the fact that you mentioned that only people have land have access to, oh, to yeah. these payments yeah, yeah. so and the most vulnerable people in, in I 
agrarian societies are usually the landless neighbors of all that. So, while many of these people would likely have access to, to land for all kinds of uh, benefits before now, uh, but what's happening to this sort of people um, who going forward might not have access to land uh, because of this sort of projects and who do not also get payments from just kind of work. Sure, uh, okay, so yeah, obviously um, it's not a common, it doesn't mean it's much cut. Uh, <laughs> you put it that way in, in all circumstances. Um, let just do one clarification. In that land market, no, there wasn't enough for it to be a livelihood act, a sustainable, not sustainable, right, a substantial livelihood activity, which would give you the choice to abandon other pretty horrible livelihood activities. In that land market, sorry, in that in that time place, it was for some people, for some of the time. So you know, there's something genuinely interesting to look into there. But of course, it's at such a small level. Uh, and it really worked, and it worked really well with people who had a load of adaptive capacity and a certain number of legal rights built into that situation. So, you know, the, the conditions under which it works, this is this this is always the immediate issue. What happens, yeah, of course it doesn't do anything for those people who are still in what what is left of Mexico's sort of agrarian society movement, bearing in mind how much urbanization has been in Mexico and how you know, the much concentration of population in the urban areas is probably not easy to characterize as an agrarian society as a whole, but there are pockets of agrarian society. Um, and ecosystems based adaptation, yeah, it doesn't do much for them. And um, it doesn't give them an incentive to, to get involved in conservation and change their behavior. So, is, is it um, the claim that the sort of projects sort of reinforce patterns of inequality making? People who already own land become even richer. It's the sort of payments that people already poor, landless, become even more richer. So, is that clear? It, it, it right. would, but it would if the payments for ecosystem services in the land land were in any way significant to the livelihoods of those people who do own land. But, you know, it was something that wasn't enough incentive for them. You know, it didn't, didn't really add much for them. Yes, it probably, you know, there is a concern there about actually you are you are like there is a lot of payments in the system center who are doing definitely better than I do about who are you paying and how does it reinforce these patterns of inequality? And um, yes, you know, for some of those you get you get paid more, I'm sure that's the case. In this particular one, they were just a bit less poor than they were, which was, yes, you know, already substantially less poor. For some, but not all, they feel like that and the people who don't own land, although some people who own land were just as poor as people who didn't own land. So it's, it's, it's kind of a mixed picture. But yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to relate back to your question. I think what came up the most from this presentation is that um, essentially it works sometimes under certain conditions, and that mm. was with any blueprint solution. And I think that what is problematic about EBA, as with any kind of project that is pushed by big international entities is that they try to standardize relations to nature at the local, national, and international level. And it mm -hmm. doesn't allow the kind of diversification that you require in order to have a self-sufficient livelihood. So mm -hmm. it, it creates strict channels through which you are um, allowed to interact with your environment and, and base your life on. And, and that in itself is within, like you were saying, the system. So that, I think that is what the con is, that it's, it's standardizing and that it, mm -hmm. it is still top down as much as you try to make it participatory by asking people because it's still envisioned as like the way for everyone to do things. Then. Sure, okay, so um... There, there, of course, be, because of what conservation agencies in Mexico can do and the kinds of things that they can prohibit or enable, um, and the, to the extent that that is you know, standardized by a, a logic of ecosystem based adaptation or a number of other conservation or other kinds of interventions, not just conservation, um, then there is a risk of coercion. Um, Especially if this is going to be applied internationally, and especially to the extent that it um, 
enables some live events, as we talked about by some groups, to at the expense of other live events. And we saw that in, in that green there, and so, uh, and maybe to some extent in that area that day as well. I mean, um, so, I think, yes, is, is, is it there, I mean, is, is that, I mean, that's kind of part of what, you know, <laughs> I don't know, I suppose governments are trying to do all the time in lots of ways. I mean, the project of government is one of to some level of homogenization of the population so that we can all be fine with other populations and so that we can all be to some extent managed in a particular way. And you can be very through coding about that and say this is just a massive oppression. Or you can say that it's a power relation um, and form of collective action which has, you know, positive and negative characteristics and is very much mediated and contested at, at, at the local level. So you need to come back and talk about ecosystem state adaptation and standardization. I mean, um, there are loads of things that you couldn't do that make the ecosystem state adaptation in Mexico because people on the land will say no, or they're just annoying. You know, um, you, you know, the, <laughs> so yes, but you know, how much coercive, potentially coercive power does it give you? To have your hand on the strings as a kind of ecosystem services in terms of what you are trying to push people towards. Yeah, that's a fair point. And it's one that we didn't talk about explicitly. And it, it, it is a cause, a cause for concern. And it comes down to things like how do you assess and feel about the culture of conservation in a, and, and the modes and mechanisms of conservation uh, in, in particular countries. And as I say, in Mexico, I'm not saying that a bunch of Saying so that there are massive trade offs between conservation and development, which you know, always will be. Uh, you know, the people that I was working with, uh, you know, there's no deep ecology that's put it that way. I'm just wondering, like, what, what is the proportion of people who have like kids uh, who don't have land and how is that distributed, and how are the actual payments determined? Um, sure. Um, so the proportion of people in in, in La Trinidad who own land, everyone owns land. Um, so everyone can everyone is eligible for those payments for ecosystem services. I don't think the exact percentage of the people of, of the population who own land in La Leona, but it's probably less than five percent. So, so, so the benefits are reaching the yeah. large majority, the overwhelming majority. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're reaching, you know, the elite, the people who turn up for your, you know, participatory um, research exercises because they're trying to see what they can get from, from the exercise. Because you're clearly looking for land and other people and stuff like that. You probably have to be really careful about the results of that. I think there's a lot of studies of participatory um, workers sort of argued that the people who even show up for the participation mm -hmm. are not the poorest. Like they don't even sure. yeah. show up yeah. at the initial meetings because they like, have other concerns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so there's a big question. We, we use the word participatory, and uh, in the in the paper that this is based on, um, before I had to cut it for word count, I mean, so a massive explanation of what we meant by participatory and how we didn't actually mean very much because we what we were trying to do was give use methods which arrive at getting some kind of level of, of, of the opinions of people. Now some of this, some of the focus groups, yes it was it was the elite, uh, you know, people were there. And you get to know this quite quickly actually. And you have to supplement by going and doing uh, either very specific focus groups for particular people that you can pick out and come across. And by doing individual interviews to kind of get around that and speaking to key informants and all of the rest of it that you can that you can do. But even if you do all of that and you present it to Gonam and you say, okay, so this is what we're saying, and one of our recommendations is, is not a particular ecosystem space adaptation measure. It's that you let people try and define what conservation is. Then what what can I do if Gonam ignores that? that? And so that, that's a massive, if you like, you know, it's problematic in some ways to call that uh, a participatory process. Perhaps it's just a collection of qualitative methods which privileges the use of group work and visual processes to get around the fact that some people don't read or write. You know, um, <clears throat> so, and we could try to 
ask Gunan, but encourage them all the rest of it and say, if you then claim this is really participatory, this is the start, this isn't really the participation. Now you have the basis on which to build a conversation and have some kind of mechanisms for joint decision making. That's the bit where it becomes genuinely participatory. And uh, that's a bit where you hope that some of the people who will be using that toolkit, and to be fair, some of the people who I met who are going to be using that toolkit, were very much aware of these kinds of considerations. But yes, it's participation in a certain way. And in terms of how the payments are determined? How the payments are determined. And then, like, who is paying how much? What is the limit? There's a sort of standard fee for uh, you know, if you're a fireman, you get so much. If you, uh, if, like a sort of, sort of daily wage, if you like. And uh, Kanan, what's that view on? Uh, like government yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a, I, mean I, I don't know what the scope is for Kanan to say this is the way you pay, for example, for maintaining a fire break you know, between the reserve and the manufacturing uh, and. Um, or we'll pay you, it's like having a, like a, a job, but like you will pay you to do monitoring services within the Biosphere Reserve of the Nagyagam Chiba, and this is the wage that you get. I don't know, didn't ask who, who actually sets that, whether it's something that's a condition of the grant which says you pay this much, or whether it's something where it's, you're given a, you know, a lump sum of money and you can split it up as, as, as you see. Um, I don't know. Okay. So there's one, I probably the last question for you. Yeah, no, it's more of a point than a question. I just mm -hmm. in listening to every all of you know the different questions and um, comments being made, I think it's just important to keep in mind or I have been hearing some blurring of lines between conservation and EPA and what the goal of EPA should be. Mm -hmm. And we've got going back to the you know definition. This is something where I think it gets confused. EPA is, you know, supposed to be used as ecosystems to help people adapt to mm -hmm. um, climate change. So it's not a way. It's not supposed to be a means of underdoing, undertaking conservation in some sort of climate change you know, scenario. So I mean, some people. I think you can argue it depends on the user of EPA and how many. You know, I mean, I, I think EPA should be seen as a part of the suite of adaptation options from hard to, you know, gray to EPA, and that the goal of EPA is focused on climate change, or it's, it should be in a climate change context, obviously, it's an easy one for the conservation community to pick up because they use biodiversity for yeah. climate change adaptation, adaptation. But I've just noticed in, you know, in the conversation going through the room that there is a bit, there has been a lot of blurring of or kind of interchanging EPA for conservation, and that's technically not what it is or what it should be. Um, and then also interchanging payments for ecosystem services with EPA. Again, it's, it's, made, it's something that's relevant to EPA, but it's not the only EPA option. So, I mean, if you're working in coastal zones, mangrove restorations, you know, are often an, an EPA option. And, livelihood activities can tie into that, like oyster collection or, or whatnot, but that might be a strict sort of, you know, you're thinking of climate change adaptation and you're deciding between building a dike or using ecosystems to, uh, aka the mangroves in this case, to um, have a, an adaptation strategy to climate change impacts if you're dealing with sea level rise. So just kind of a word of caution, I guess, on when thinking about these things and talking about them, to try to keep in mind what what they're meant for. And yeah. <laughs> sure, I agree, but I, I think it's a little bit sort of I don't know. It's, it, with respect, I think that's a footnote because what percentage of people who are not conservationists are actually doing the citizen science adaptation? I mean, and if you if there are so many conservation organisations that are either interested in it or who are doing it, and in the context of a talk in which the National Commission for Natural Protected Areas commissioned a vulnerability analysis which was framed in terms of ecosystems based adaptation, I think it's pretty obvious that it's, it's seen 
as a bioconservationist, as um, a me mechanism by then, it was supposed to be a mechanism to, to help ecosystems adapt as much as um, people, although all the data on were the ecosystems vulnerable, what was happening with climate impacts was so uncertain in the overall long term system, you couldn't really do much on that side. It's much easier to think about what you do with the people, and that's why that part of the project took up a lot more. But I I don't think it's problematic to have been talking about conservationists using ecosystems based on adaptation levels in the way that we have been. Um, notwithstanding the caveat that you're saying, but it's, it's, it, it's yeah, broadly speaking, there are other people who can use it as a sort of adaptation. It might be, I don't know, it might be sort of like, a, I don't know, people who are in charge of like coastlines or stuff like that, who are not necessarily interested in biodiversity conservation, but they may be managing environmental risk. Yeah, so I, I do take that point, but it's got quite a lot of volume for me. Conservation oh, agents are yeah. some of the biggest actors you know, who are formulating discourses around ecosystems based adaptation and who are funding it, the conservation actors. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm arguing for it should yeah. should become a more widely right. yeah. widely sure. used approach generally if the climate change adaptation tool could, let's say, um, you know, for people making decisions generally on how are we going to adapt to climate change. Considering a, a variety of, of options for even from how to do those things, um, but yeah, I agree with you that obviously up, up until now that it's mostly been about like right, conservation practitioners, yeah. and, that, and and then also in that um, context, that's I think kind of the meaning of it is we we put some of thinking more then about the ecosystems, like protecting the ecosystems, then using the ecosystems to help protect people. So. Um, it's just, I, I mean, I agree that sure. that's what's going on. I guess I'm just advocating that it's such a change. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to Andy for a very interesting talk. Uh, um, and thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, uh, right. Next week we'll be having um, a presentation by myself uh, talking about something very similar to this, of Red Flux, which is more national, nationally framed uh, uh, payment of the STEM program. Um, looking at how that is really connected in Nigeria, the complexities around it, and what's actually going on on the ground. But framing that within questions of neoliberal conservation, what's neoliberal conservation, uh, is, is at the very variety of projects that we're seeing, and the complexities around this project suggest that something else is going on aside from the, the traditional ways of thinking about the neoliberal conservation uh, projects. So we look forward to seeing as many of you uh, able to, to come and um, you have a wonderful evening. Uh, Andy, I don't know if you have uh, any last words or anything. <coughs> Not really, but just thanks for coming guys and hoping to see you a number of these. And you guys, especially in the physical part of the development course, was this helpful? Yeah. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah.